If Russia invades, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. Any adjustment to our policy will be gradual. I've been doing this 30 years and I've never seen markets like this. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Christine Lagarde insists any adjustment at the ECB will be gradual. Bonds again on the back foot. Markets weigh the risk of tighter monetary policy. D.C. and Berlin United, President Biden warns the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would be stopped if Russia invades Ukraine. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition this hour. Music mogul Merk Mercuriadis joins us. We discuss Spotify, tonight's Brit Awards, and, of course, the industry as a whole whole as we see higher returns. Send in your questions on IB plus TV Go. Now, first thing is first, let's check into the markets and, of course, a repricing of bonds also broadening to the bigger market. I think the story is, of course, on the term in two-year yield with what we've seen in the last week, but really it's all playing out in the U.S. 10-year yield. Now, I'm looking at a lot of bank calls, including, for example, a Citigroup expecting U.S. yields to soon touch 2 percent. We have a couple of calls also at 3 percent. We had a fantastic interview with Elga Barge of BlackRock. Uh, an insider at the ECB in the previous life, really telling us about the dynamics and differential between what we're seeing from Germany and what we're seeing from the U.S. Now, that German 10-year uh, yield, actually, or two-year yield, 10 days actually have risen, and that could mean a little bit more pressure on the ECB to try and uh, not widen those spreads. European stocks, again, distracted by what's happening in bonds, but they're also looking at earnings, getting some six-tenths of a percent. Now, it is also a story of differential. We had a fantastic interview with our Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs and crude oil, the one to watch out for, because when this gets to 100, a lot of the companies that are in the oil space will benefit, but it could put a lot of pressure on some of the politics, including BP today coming out with uh, more dividends. If you look at the difference between what renewables are giving shareholders and oil companies, it's one to watch out for, which may not be the way that climate change watchers want it to go. And then the CAC 40 and the FTSE MIB gaining between 7 tenths of 8% and 1%. But the story, again, is one of divergence, especially in bonds between Germany, Italy, Germany, and Greece. Now, the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, has said any adjustment to monetary policy will be gradual as the debate over the euro region's first interest rate hike in more than a decade heats up. A rate hike will not occur before our net asset purchases finish. Moreover, there are three conditions that will have to be satisfied before the Governing Council feels sufficiently confident that a tilt in our policy rate is appropriate. All the three conditions are meant as safeguards against a premature increase in interest rates. Finally, any adjustment to our policy will be gradual. Well, we're now joined by Patrick Armstrong, Chief Investment Officer of Plurimi Wealth, in the studio. Big day for us. And Bloomberg's Christina Kino, our markets editor. Christine, let's kick off with you. When you look at European yields and some uh, of the moves that we saw there, uh, at what point does it start you know, inflicting pain on riskier assets in Europe? Well, Francine, I in particular am watching out for those funding costs for corporates on the ground. And I think that's really where you would want to look for signs of pain at the onset. You know, it's, it's one thing, I think, uh, for, for yields to be um, moving in this direction and at this pace. And it's another for um, just the, the, the real economy impact of it via corporates not being able to access the funding that they would want um, in this sort of environment. I think that really is when it starts to bite uh, for for folks on the ground and, and really an indication of these financial conditions starting to really tighten as uh, the ECB and, and other central banks head into tighter policy. Let's also bring in, of course, uh, Patrick Armstrong. Patrick, I want to talk about my morning must read. And this is from Bloomberg Opinions, Marcus Ashworth. Uh, he wrote a piece called The World Gets Back to the Right Side of Zero. And he says, I have long argued against the folly of inverting the time value of money. It's unnatural. He says, madness lies as being incentivized to borrow. We spend more than we earn and our children and their children will be saddled with paying all back of it. So is the, is the premise actually of interest rates moving a good thing longer term? So a bit of pain for bond traders now, but it's all for the best. 
I think you have to get back to zero to have any sense of normalcy. Um, we've had extreme measures that were needed with the pandemic. Um, we've had a crisis situation in the economy. Um, we had negative interest rates even before that. Uh, getting to zero is still a very accommodative policy in any textbook you read. I don't think any uh, chief financial officer is going to change capital expenditure plans when right. interest rates go from negative to zero. Right, but what happens, for example, in U.S. Treasury? So if we have 3% this year, and I know it's a big if, but we could, what does it mean for portfolios? I think it's a duration call. So we're short treasuries. Um, we're short the most extreme growth companies, the companies that don't have earnings yet, where you really have to discount future cash flows and have... Uh, grandiose assumptions about what kind of market share they'll get over the next decade. Those kind of companies are at risk. Companies that are producing cash flow today that are paying dividend yields, those kind of companies are already trading at multiples that are 10 to 12, a lot of them, and, and that's normal. So as you, if you get to a normal interest rate, normal valuations, I don't think it should be impaired. And Christine, this goes back to one of your main takeaways for BP, which is actually dividends are back. But if you put that in context with rising yields, what does it mean for, for these big oil majors? Yeah, it's definitely going to be a bit more of a challenge, Francine, because, you know, the, the appeal of these dividend yielding stock back when yields were super, super low is that comparative yield that they offer. And now that's a little bit less of a selling point, given that yields are what, what where they are. And so I think it's a matter of, you know, making those um, dividends attractive enough that investors stay enticed to these um, types of stocks even despite the higher yield environment that we're seeing. So is that how you choose companies? Dividend I think you, rich? And also share buybacks. It's another form of yield so that's what American companies have been doing so successfully so I think uh, look at the actual yield but uh, if they're buying back shares that's a, a very powerful tailwind for equity investors as well. So I have a great chart, actually, which I kind of made for you in mind. Um, and it's looking at high yield, because I know if you've liked it in the past, and Valerie helped me put this together. I don't know if we have it, because I'm a little bit late in calling it. But basically, it shows the credit market now showing signs of stress, raising the chances of a disorderly play out in yields, piling further pressure on global risk assets. Do you still like anything in the, in the high yield space? I, I still prefer high yield, because it comes with a shorter duration, just naturally. They're generally issued with shorter durations. They have a higher yield so that pulls the duration down as well we're still in a phase where the economy is growing faster than potential in all regions so I don't think we're in an environment where I expect defaults I think uh, central banks will be hiking that'll put some pressures on these higher yielding companies but uh, I still prefer high yield to uh, a boon or a treasury. Yeah, very quickly, European bank earnings are a little bit mixed today, actually, Christine. Yeah, absolutely, Francine. And I think it really is a question of, is it too early for them to start benefiting from this higher yield, higher interest rate environment, given that we haven't actually seen these rate hikes yet? So perhaps 4Q might not be the place to be looking for those benefits yeah. just yet, perhaps a little bit later, uh, maybe this year into 1Q or the second quarter. Yeah, do you own any banks? We don't have, we have Citibank in America, we don't have any European banks. I'm okay. going to wait until I sense a steepening of the curve. So we're okay. at the point where curve's still inverting, um, steepening will lead okay. to some interest rate margin. Okay, so we're what, a couple of weeks away from that, given things, the way things I, are going, Patrick? Well, I'm short boons, I'm short <laughs> treasury, so I do expect a okay. steepening, but I want to see it happen rather than expect it to happen. Okay, buy into it. Uh, thank you both. Bloomberg's Trina Kino looking at the markets, and Patrick Armstrong, Chief Investment Officer of Plurimi Wealth, stays with us. I know he has a couple of thoughts also on Tech. Coming up, we speak to the Hypnosis founder and chief executive, Mer Mercuriadis, at around 9.30 a.m. London time. This is really a conversation about to the music industry and some of the returns that we've seen there. They've been buying huge catalogs from famous artists, but what does that mean when inflation is rising? Stay tuned for that interview. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. I've been doing this 30 years and I've never seen markets like this. This is a molecule crisis. We're out of everything. I don't care if it's oil, gas, coal, copper, alley, you name it, we're out of it. Jeff Curry on Roaring Forum, the Goldman Sachs Global Head of Commodities Research, talking about price surges. More from him on the latest on energy commodities and markets. Check out the price of power on Bloomberg.com and YouTube. Now, SoftBank plans to take UK chip designer Arm Public after it proposed a $66 billion sale of the business to NVIDIA, and that collapsed after regulators expressed competition concerns. With us to unpack all of this is Bloomberg's tech reporter, Ivan Livingstone. So, and then we go, of course, to Patrick Armstrong, 
to look at whether he's scooping up some of these technology stocks. So, Ivan, thanks so much for joining us. SoftBank confirmed that the market, what the market's expected. So, what's next for ARM? Well, there's a lot next for ARM, Francine. You know, the company now has to prepare for its IPO. That's looking like it'll come kind of in the next year or so. There's also a change of leadership at the top of the firm. And, you know, this key player in the global semiconductor industry, they need to repair some of their relationships with their customers and also focus on their position right. in China. So I'm also quite obsessed with this Facebook story, Meta, because yesterday they kind of, you know, hurt or the EU saying, look, if you don't go by our rules, then we're just going to pull out of Europe. I mean, it doesn't really make sense for them from a strategic but also revenue point of view. Yeah, it's hard to believe that Facebook, you know, Meta actually pulls out of Europe. Uh, there's this wrangling over where the company's data is stored, and we've seen data localization issues play out before. So there's negotiations between the EU and the U.S., and if I had to guess, you know, this will end in some sort of compromise, and I'll still be able to use Instagram in London. Uh, yeah. I know. Everyone in the newsroom was like, wait, are we still going to be using WhatsApp and things like that? Amazon. So Amazon is paying their workers a lot more, and that feeds to wage inflation. Yeah, we've seen this play out across industries. At tech in particular, there's such a demand for talent. Any CEO will tell you it's their top issue right now. So I think we're going to see only more of this to come. All right, so Bloomberg News technology reporter Ivan Livingston joining us with some three top stories. And we're back with Patrick Armstrong, Chief Investment Officer of Plurimi Well. Patrick, I guess, for, I mean, the million dollar question when it comes to Amazon is that they were before paying in stock. So I don't know whether this is really inflation because they have to increase a base salary yeah. instead of going stock because the stock was down. If, if you had stock options the last two years in Amazon, you've not been incredibly thrilled, actually. Uh, the stock's been uh, a laggard over that period, especially over the last 18 months. It's done nothing. But uh, it's just a si symptomatic of everything. So Apple paid $100,000 extra per software engineer and bonuses a few months ago. Um, you've got to pay more. You've got to pay cash. You've got to yeah. keep the long-term incentive plans in place. But it's a combination of everything. So, Patrick, when you look at inflation and people say, look, this is supply, this is actually a wage inflation if you want to get the, the I mean, is, does inflation inflation then cool off if wages go like this in 2021? Yeah, wages lead to even. sustainable inflation yeah. because it inputs, it creates higher cost structures and it creates higher spending power. So both sides of the inflation equation go up uh, with higher wages. And you've seen wages rise 5.5% over the last year in the United States, which very high number, but it's actually lagged inflation. So uh, real wages have actually fallen over the last year. Do you own any meta? Meta, we do Facebook. own Meta, yes. We didn't buy after the sell-off. We haven't sold it. It's yeah. a company that's a middling 16, 17 times earnings. It's going to keep producing massive cash flow. So I'm not pounding the table to buy it, but okay. it's too cheap to sell right now. Uh, what about Amazon? Amazon, don't own it, haven't owned it for years. Um, doing incredible things in cloud, but so is everyone else. If you look at uh, Alphabet, if you look at even IBM, um, it's going to be a very high growth area. But I think margins won't be able to be sustained in cloud because it's going to be hyper competitive. And I don't think one company is going to have a category killer that everyone needs to have Amazon Web Services versus uh, other competitors. Patrick, it, it seems that a lot of the earnings calls, actually the focus away from technology was on inventories. How do you see inventories playing out in, in you know, the big companies? Um, yeah, inventories, it's a potential tailwind for growth as well. Um, and it's everywhere. So it's commodity inventories have been drawn down. Um, you've not seen capital capital investment from big companies, inventories are low, I think they'll be replenished. Um, it's something that you've actually seen some sectors as well with inventories builds, but semiconductors is where there's a shortage that's going to stay and I think that's going to be pricing powers for the companies that are producing those chips. If we have a sustained rise in yields, where does it hurt most in sectors? It's the longest duration sector. So it's the companies that don't have earnings, that don't have cash flows today, that are betting on what will happen over the next decade, the dream stocks, story stocks. And it's uh, higher yields mean uh, lower multiples on revenues for those types of companies. So I, I do think there's still air pockets. I don't feel that there's been capitulation from the, the dreamers who thought these companies were going to grow at ridiculous right. levels forever. Should we look at consolidation? I, mean, I know armed It's happening already, open. exactly. Even in banks? We've been talking about it for years. For 10 it's going years. to happen. Oh. And that's, is it going to happen? It will at some point. It has to happen because Europe is overbanked. Um, if you get to a point where there's no concerns about bad, de bad debts, what's being hidden there, and a steeper yield curve, I think probably we will get it, but it's not yeah. happening soon. Um, Patrick, what was your craziest investment strategy of 2021 that you will not repeat in 2022? 2021. Can't be crypto. 
No, I've not touched crypto. It's something I think crypto ends at uh, zero, the bitcoins. Um, it's a speculative asset that has no real purpose, in my opinion. But uh, I didn't do anything crazy in 2021. I think it's been a time right now where it's about preserving and growing purchasing power, putting capital to work in moderate growth rather than chasing massive returns. So uh, it's not a market that I'm incentivized to take those kind of uh, big punts right now. If you look at a pure macro point of view, I mean, the Asian bonds could actually get a bit of a lift because they're the last ones to normalize. Do you want to play that? Um, not playing it now. I prefer the uh, current, the commodity exporting com countries, um, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa. I think you're getting a real tailwind from commodity prices and uh, it's also improving their, their credit profile as well. So uh, you're getting very big yields, especially if you buy their inflation linked bonds from those countries. You're getting inflation plus 2% on a, a very high inflation rate as well. Patrick, thank you so much. Patrick Armstrong there, Chief Investment Officer of Pluremi Wealth, joining us with a number of calls. Now, coming up, the shuttle diplomacy continues as efforts to avert tensions over Ukraine escalating into conflict seek a breakthrough. We have the latest next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden says a controversial Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline between Russia and Germany would be stopped if Moscow invades Ukraine, a plan which Russia has denied. The comment came at a press conference alongside German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Of course, there is a military threat in Ukraine, against Ukraine. We cannot remain silent on that. We see the number of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border. And that is a serious threat to European security. If Russia makes a choice to further invade Ukraine, we are jointly ready and all of NATO is ready. We're ready to continue talks in good faith with Russia. Neither Russia nor the Europeans want chaos or instability when nations have already suffered from the pandemic. So we need to agree on concrete measures. A number of President Macron's ideas, proposals, while it's too early to speak of them, are possible as a basis for further steps. Now for more, we're joined by our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo in Brussels. So Maria, Olaf Scholz in D.C., Macron in Moscow, they're set to debrief in Berlin. Not much has been achieved. Are you still expecting a breakthrough? Well, Francine, I would actually say that not in terms of a breakthrough, but these two trips had two different goals. For Olaf Scholz, this was about going to the United States and speaking to, quote, my American friends and making it clear that Germany is a reliable partner. That was the goal of this trip. And yesterday he spoke in English. He took a Q&A. Then he went on primetime news to make that case for Germany and kept repeating this message. We are fully in line with NATO and we're fully aligned with the United States. When it comes to Nord Stream 2, as you know, very very well, Francine, then it gets very tricky because there's no positive scenario for Germany, whether you ditch it or not. In many ways, they're facing litigation and going to have to pay money that goes to Russia. When you see what Emmanuel Macron did yesterday, well, the French argue that essentially what they did was to take one for the team. That press conference with Vladimir Putin was very rough for Emmanuel Macron, but they believe that France has a responsibility to try to broker a deal. They say they weren't expecting a breakthrough, but nonetheless, they continue to talk. But in terms of the actual specifics, well, you could argue that Emmanuel when Macron walked out of Moscow with a nice dinner, five hours, but very little yeah. on paper. <laughs> I know it was like a six course dinner and six hour a six course dinner and six hours of talk with this massive, massive, like socially table. distanced table, which captured everyone's attention. European natural gas Maria, in terms of what the markets are doing, uh, really rose following Biden's remarks that if there's an invasion, Nord Stream two is dead. Yeah, and he repeated that message. One way or another, there is going to be no Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Now, for the Germans, having said that, that question was put to Olaf Scholz, Francine, so many times. And it was this idea of why can you not just say, yes, we're going to ditch it. Olaf Scholz did not give that answer. But again, you know, Francine, we know that for the German government, this is very tricky. The thing is huge. It's already built. The Nord Stream 1 is also operational. Now, it depends on the regulator what to do with the number 2. But either way, whether they ditch it, whether they try to sanction it, Germany is in a very tricky situation, both politically, but also the financial strings that comes with the contract. This thing is already signed and, and built. 
Maria, thank you so much. Uh, Maria, today, of course, with uh, some of the ins and outs of exactly what going, what's going on if you scratch beneath the surface, it's a lot more complicated. Our European correspondent in Brussels getting to the nitty-gritty of what we should be looking out for. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine, and thank you. Meta has again threatened to pull Facebook and Instagram from Europe if it is unable to keep transferring user data back to the US. It is among thousands of companies that rely on a transatlantic data deal, which was struck down by the EU Court of Justice in 2020 on data security concerns. Europe and the US have been in negotiations for months to replace that agreement. Now, the US and Japan have reached a truce on Trump era steel tariffs. Washington says it will stop the 25% levy on imports of up to 1.25 million metric tons a year. The solution mirrors the accord struck with the European Union in October. Japan is the fifth biggest steel exporter to the US. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. You and I need to talk about uh, getting off Instagram, maybe. Uh, coming up, we talk about the music industry with Mark Mercuriatis. Christine Lagarde insists on any adjustment at the ECB will be gradual. Bonds again on the back foot. Markets weigh the risk of tighter monetary policy. Now, D.C. and Berlin United, President Biden warns Nord Stream 2 pipeline would be stopped if Russia invades Ukraine. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, music mogul Merck Mercuriatis joins us. We discuss Spotify, tonight's Brit Awards, and, of course, the music industry and returns. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, first thing is first, a huge churn, especially when it comes to bond markets. Uh, we see a repricing when it comes to 10-year yields. This is a global benchmark for Treasuries. I have a lot of banks saying, look, if you look at where the U.S. 10-year yield is at and the pace at which it's moved, currently at 19377, we could see 2%. That's a huge psychological level. Uh, Elga Bart of BlackRock actually pushing back that we could see U.S. 10-year at 3%. But what happens after 2%, you know, doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. And we could see a lot more pain repricing in the broader markets. Now, on to our music industry. And after decades overseeing the management of artists like Elton John and Beyonce, Merck Mercuriatis founded Hypnosis in 2018. Now, the $1.9 billion music royalties fund aims to capitalize on the surge in streaming and turn music into an asset class with predictable returns. Over the past three years, Mercuriatis has scooped up the copyrights to more than 64 thousand songs and we are delighted to be joined by Merck and Mercury Artists right now. So Merck, thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be a robust conversation on the music industry, which everybody loves, right. not many people understand, but also streaming and how this evolves. First of all, the Brit Awards tonight. You're excited because you've been pushing for such a long time for writers to be recognized and finally they will get the chance tonight. Yes, tonight will be the first time that there's a Songwriter of the Year Award uh, at the Brit Awards. Uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, as you point out, you know, when I started Hypnosis in 2018, I had my motive, which was to establish songs as an asset class and give the investment community access to the predictable, reliable income that comes from these great songs when they become a part of the fabric of our society. But equally well, I had an ulterior motive, which was to advocate for songwriters, use our, the platform of our, of our success to advocate for songwriters and to get them the recognition that they res deserve. Because Ultimately, the songwriter is delivering the most important component to yep. the music industry, but they are the lowest man, paid man or woman in the totem pole, so we wanted to change that, and this is a nice recognition of that. But, Merck, when you look at the industry, I mean, it's already been disrupted by you know, the likes of Spotify, Apple, the streaming services. How much more disruption will we see in it? We'll see a lot, because, you know, we had 16 years of technological disruption, which effectively meant that people could consume music for free via legal downloading. The likes of Spotify and Apple have come through and in many ways they've given us the perfect vehicle for people to consume 
music by because they're now paying for music once again and it's made it more convenient to do so. So, you know, the, the offering of being able to get everything from the Beatles to Beethoven and Chopin to Chic under one roof yeah. um, has made it so that, you know, we've gone from 30 million paid subscribers when we started Hypnosis to now over 500 million paid subscribers globally to music streaming services. And I know you've had huge inflows, actually, of investors wanting to come into your fund. So I guess the question now is inflation goes up. You can't really, because royalties are negotiated so far in advance, you can't really keep up with inflation is there a way of hedging well I th you know I'm not sure that there's a, a perfect hedging solution for inflation but I think we're a very very close um, solution to it in the sense that when people are living their best lives they're doing it to a soundtrack of great music equally well when they're experiencing the sort of challenges you know we've had two years of COVID challenge we're now about to have an inflation challenge um, people are taking escape and comfort in consuming these great songs the likes of Spotify and Apple have strong pricing power, yeah. and we get a percentage of that price. So as their price increases, our percentage increases as well. So I think we'll do very well out of it. it does it track inflation? Yes. Okay. So it tracks, so if inflation is at 7%, for example, the UK, Apple has that power of, of, of increasing it by 7%. Well, I think, you know, we've seen, obviously, Netflix make their increase recently. Yeah. Um, I'm not suggesting that there'll be an increase imminently amongst the music right. streaming services, but that ability is there. I think they have that pricing power. So your biggest competitors actually in the space are, are the big you know, universals of this world and the big music companies. Well, they, you know, in the first almost four years of, of, of having hypnosis and acquiring these incredible assets, um, they really weren't paying attention to, to what we were doing. Now they've started to pay attention and, you know, you've seen the likes of Bruce Springsteen and you've seen the likes of Bob Dylan, some very, very big deals. But in general, you know, unless it's a, a superstar, an extraordinary superstar art artist of that caliber, we don't really feel them that much. Um, Mark, I know you've, of course, you know, acquired some of the things of Neil Young. Sure. Was it a, you know, did you discuss what happened with Spotify and he deci his decision to pull out of Spotify ahead of it? Um, we did, and you know, Neil is someone that, you know, if you look at the value of his songs, on the one hand, they're valuable because he's a wonderful artist and he writes great songs. On the other hand, they're valuable because of the way that he's conducted himself throughout his career with integrity. He's always been a leader. So what Neil, the, the, the position that Neil has taken against Spotify, which is about a Spotify podcaster, Joe Rogan, spreading misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine, is a position that's completely consistent with the way that he's conducted himself with his fan base. If we go back to the predictability and reliability of why we would want to buy someone like Neil Young, it's because those fans that make his income predictable and reliable believe in him. Does, but does it change actually your returns or your relationship with Spotify? They become publishing it, companies. It doesn't change our relationship with Spotify because obviously we have a, a tremendous catalog that's, you know, small in relative terms, but very, very high value and incredibly high ratio of success within it. So there's lots for Spotify to get stuck in. But in terms of our returns, the interesting thing about Neil is that his consumption has gone up. Um, in the two weeks since he came off the service. So we're 38% up in, in streaming alone. I mean, we're hundreds of percentages up in terms of album sales and things like that, but we're 38% up in streaming without Spotify over what we were with Spotify. I mean, I find it amazing, you know, talking about some of the music that we love in, in financial terms, and this is something that we haven't really heard in the past. What's the artist that's, you know, seeing the most streamings at the moment? Ed Sheeran. So we're, we're very lucky. We have, I think at last count, 58 of the 211 songs that have streamed more than a billion times on Spotify. And at the very top of that list is Ed Sheeran's Shape of You. Johnny McDade, who co-wrote that song as a part of Hypnosis, will be presenting at the Brit Awards tonight. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Ed is obviously one of the artists of our time. So how much more do you want to buy? How many, how many more, you know, songs or th things out there? And is, are you fundraising at the moment? Is it easy to find the money? So we have our public company, which yep. is fully invested at this moment in time. But then we have our relationship with Blackstone as well. Yes, Blackstone are a partner, correct. Yep. Blackstone are a partner in, in, in the management company, Hypnosis yep. Song Management. And we have a private fund with Blackstone. Yep. And we've announced that we have a billion dollars to yep. spend initially with Blackstone. We in, intend to do a lot more than that over the next three years or so. So what's the attraction for Blackstone in actually joining forces with you? 
these predictable, reliable incomes that come from 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 these songs. Obviously, they're I think they're you know ultimately you could consider them to be the gold standard in terms right. of private equity, but and we have an access. Insider. Right. Well, we have access. Yeah. You know, the, so you know my relationship. You know, if, if I go back to this this aspect of advocating for the songwriter as 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 well as working with the songwriter, that has made us the preferred buyer of the songwriting community. So we have this incredible access to the most wonderful artists and songwriters, and of course Blackstone are are, are here to, on the one hand, mm -hmm. help us to invest in those great songs, and on the other hand, they're also here to make us a more sophisticated yeah. business. One of the attractions for me to Blackstone is that the music business is very unsophisticated. It's allowed... In what way? In the sense that, that, you know, an artist, for example, doesn't know what they're being paid. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to take your, your pay slip home, yeah. and you know exactly what work you put in, you know exactly why you're being paid. That doesn't exist in the music business. So something as simple as that, where a songwriter doesn't doesn't know what they're going to get paid for their work, um, and I want Blackstone to help me make yeah. this a more sophisticated business, as well as a better management company for our public fund as well. So I know that the CMA is also looking at the streaming industry to look at some of the practices. How do you think that will change it? I think it will. So you know, the the this started with the DCMS, the yeah. Department of Culture, Music, and Sport, doing an investigation into the the what they called the economic practices of the streaming services. We applaud that. We applauded that report, but as we gave our written evidence, and Nile Rogers also appeared on our behalf in person, um, we said to them, "Listen, we think what, when, as you get deeper into this, what you're going to see is that the relationship that exists between the major recorded music companies." and their ownership and control of the major publishing companies has a real impact on how the songwriter is paid because they want all the money to right. go towards yeah. recorded music. Yeah. The CMA have recognized that, or the DMS recognized that, DCMS recognized yeah. that, referred it to the CMA, and one of the most important issues in the CMA now is to investigate what they consider to be the okay. dominance of the major recorded music companies. Do you never not have fun in your job? Because it seems I like always, a pretty cool, it seems like a pretty cool, you know, way of, of marrying finance and music. I always have tremendous fun in my, in, in my job, and I think that, that ultimately, you know, we're doing something that, that, as I say, not only allows us to have songs recognized as an asset class, but also gives us a platform to be able to fight for yeah. the songwriter. And, and, and that's completely in alignment with our shareholders. If we get the songwriters paid more money, our shareholders are making more money. Do, do you think Spotify should have cut off Joe Rogan? I don't think that Spotify should cut off Joe Rogan, but I think they should do exactly what Neil has suggested they do, which is to put health warnings on his podcasts. Yeah. And I think they should stand up and, and applaud Neil for taking a strong position. Um, Mark, what are you listening at the moment? How do you listen, actually? Do you stream things? Or, um, or? I stream things all day long, but I also listen to vinyl, you know, for a, a, a lot. Every, every day I'm listening to vinyl for a couple of hours, at least in the evening, when uh, uh, I'm answering my That's emails. That's pretty and, cool. And, all right. And getting... your, your boldest prediction for the Brit Awards? I think, you know, Ed Sheeran is going to be a sensation, and he's playing some of our songs, so I'm thrilled about that. But Pink Panthers, I think Pink, you know, is, so, you know we, we're obviously in the legacy business and, and we're, we're managing these incredible catalogs, but you, we also have to look at what the future catalogs of tomorrow are, and I think Pink Panthers is doing something very exciting. All right, all of our viewers are now checking out, especially the boomers. <laughs> Merck, thank you so much for joining us. Merck Mercuriatis, their chief executive and founder of Hypnosis. Now, coming up, I've never seen commodity markets pricing in the shortages there are right now. The words of the closely followed head of commodities research at Goldman Sachs, Jeff Curry. He was on this program earlier. We'll bring you that story next. This is Bloomberg. Right now, the upside risk in this, this market is exceptionally high. One of the reasons why, you know, is alluded to, the markets are incredibly tight from a physical perspective. Um, you know, whether you see it on the uh, refining margins or in you know, crude oil itself, the entire complex is extraordinarily tight, reflected in that super backwardation. Um, obviously, 
what it means is that this market is incredibly vulnerable to any type of supply or demand disruption, very much like what we saw in European gas and power, um, you know, let's say late last year. So oil has now teed itself up, you know, to look very similar to what European gas and power looks like. You know, that was what we, we, we highlighted this risk back in October of last year. We're at that point right now. And so the question is, can you come up with any supply or reduction in demand as you move into the spring to be able to ease the situation? Now, 2008 was a financial crisis. This is a molecule crisis. We're out of everything. I don't care if it's oil, gas, coal, copper, alley, you name it, we're out of it. Um, and it's, you know, the backwardation in this market is an indication of just how different this market structure is from 2008. 2008, the curve was going up by the back end, dragging it up. It was in contango at some points in time, which tells you it was paper financial buying on the back end as opposed to outright shortages. This curve is as kind of super backwardated, and many of these commodities are super backwardated, which is you know textbook shortages. In fact, you know when Keynes created the, you know the idea of backwardation in the 1930s, you know this was what he had in mind, and we have not seen such types of backwardation. I've been doing this 30 years, and I've never seen markets like this. This is textbook shortages. That was a Goldman Sachs, a global head of commodities research, Jeff Curry, there on price surges. And for more from him on the latest energy commodities and markets outlook, check out the price of power on Bloomberg.com and YouTube. Now let's get the latest from the tech sector and let's start with SoftBank as it plans an IPO for chip designer Arm after NVIDIA abandoned a proposed acquisition in the face of fierce opposition from regulators and customers. Well, joining us now is our Bloomberg anchor, Danny Berger, one of my favorite people to speak to about tech. First of all, Danny, when you look at SoftBank, look, this is a major setback for SoftBank. Yeah, and Masayoshi son on the call to investors was really surprised or at least expressed surprise about how tough regulators were with Nvidia's acquisition of Arm. He seemed to think that this would be okay that Arm is so influential that, you know, whether Nvidia or SoftBank owns it, it should go through, but there's due diligence. Yeah. I mean, where were yeah. they on the due diligence ahead of this, right? Well, I, I think that there was a lot of skepticism whether or not they would be able to go through yeah. with this deal. But look, it had been going through all the necessary stages. We did seem to be getting closer and closer to it. But so many people voiced opposition, with, whether it was the people who licensed, uh, licensed yeah. ARM technology or regulators. Okay, Amazon. I mean, yes. th you know, they're doubling the base salary for a lot of workers. But yeah, I don't know bad. whether this is because, <laughs> not too bad, what, 350000 <laughs> Exactly. I don't know whether this is because the stock price was under such mm. pressure or whether they just need to retain talent at all costs. Definitely both of them. Yeah. There had been media reports of them in crisis mode about how many people they were losing 50 VPs. That's a lot. That's a lot of VPs, <laughs> absolutely, especially when you're looking at top ranking talent. Now, usually they would report reward people with stock, yeah. to your point. But when Amazon stock isn't doing well, I mean, why would you accept that? Why not go to a company, maybe a private company where you get paid well? Stock price isn't an issue. So Amazon is saying, okay, we might not give as many stock awards. Mm. Got up the base pay. All right, so Facebook, or now mm. known as Meta, suddenly yesterday we're like, you know, once again, if we don't get the terms we want to by the commission, then we're out of Europe. So yeah. are we going to be able to WhatsApp? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Look, I, I, it's really hard to imagine a scenario where Facebook isn't present in Europe, where you don't have Instagram, you don't have Facebook, you right. don't have WhatsApp. So it does seem a bit of a power play here, but this just goes to the point that Facebook meta continues to face regulatory scrutiny. Big tech in general does, going back to a conversation about NVIDIA. So this really is a power play on their part. Um, and, you know, Politics front and center for Facebook. There you go, politics left, right, and center, but we still want access to WhatsApp. Facebook, we're less interested. Yeah, don't need our that da one. Our <laughs> Burger there with the very latest on tech. Now, coming up, BP Chief Executive Bernard Looney on the Energy Giants announcement of an additional $1.5 billion share buyback. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Actually, was a, a good year for uh, for trading in uh, 2021. Um, we have uh, a, a great organization. I'm I'm very proud of them. As we look to the future, um, oil prices. Um, it's it's always difficult to tell. I think we've learned uh, early in our career that making predictions uh, isn't always the smartest thing to do. But um, there is a lot of uncertainty. I think today we've got what's going to happen with Iran. We've got what's going to happen. 
with the response, the shale response uh, in North America. We've got concerns uh, in Libya. We've got questions about demand. What happens if there's another variant? So a lot of uncertainty. Um, but what I will say is that demand is strong. Um, and you can um, easily see uh, a further tightening market uh, throughout this year. But more than anything, I think we should expect some volatility. And at the end of the day, we don't know what the price of oil is going to be. And that's why we're running our company to focus on a break even of around $40 so that we're resilient to a range of price outcomes. We don't control it, but we do control how we run our business. That's why we're taking out $2.5 billion of cost. That's why we're uh, doubling down on convenience, convenience sales up 20% over the last couple of years. Well, that was the BP chief executive, Bernard Looney, speaking to Bloomberg a little bit earlier. And of course, the price, uh, if you look at the share price, uh, if we bring that up for you, we should get it. There you go, 1.5% after the huge uh, dividend. So we were speaking to a couple of market analysts that were saying, yes, it's a good return. And also, we have a great chart that our Valerie put together looking at uh, the difference between some of the renewable space and oil majors. Now, let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Garrens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. ECB President Christine Lagarde says any adjustment to monetary policy will be gradual as the debate over the euro region's first rate hike in more than a decade does heat up. Lagarde told European lawmakers a central bank would remain data dependent while assessing the medium term outlook for inflation. She also warned that price growth could turn out faster than expected in the short term. Last month's U.S. stock market route is making wealthy investors uneasy. According to a UBS wealth management survey, almost half of high net worth individuals globally said they were highly concerned about a market downturn. In the U.S., 61% said they had more than 10% of their portfolio in cash and in equivalents. One of Mark Zuckerberg's longest standing advisors is stepping down from Meta's board in May. Bloomberg has learned Peter Thiel plans to focus on supporting former President Donald Trump's agenda during this year's midterm elections and does not want his political activities to be a distraction. Thiel has worked with Facebook for nearly two decades. Blackstone is said to be exploring a combination of its European building materials retailer with a similar business owned by CBC Capital Partners. Sources say Blackstone is discussing a possible merger of building materials Europe with CBC's Stark Group alongside preparations to list the company. We are told it's seeking to value the business at almost $7 billion in any deal. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Let's get to a lengthy market check because we've seen some wild gyrations in the last couple of weeks or actually days. Stocks in Europe at the moment are gaining. Commodity producers are receiving a boost from rising metal prices and pretty solid earnings. Now, Treasury yields climbing, the dollar strengthening. Now, on the downside, we had some earnings news from the French lender BNP Paribas. It's dropping more than 3% after fourth quarter revenue lagged some of the cost increases. And then overall, we're looking at retailers with, for example, the online grocer Ocado here in the UK. Uh, slumping more than 8% and some of the full-year profit disappointed. Now, the story, without a doubt, is definitely what we're seeing. The 10-year Treasury yield briefly rising above 1.95%, a level loss seen since December 2019. Some investors predicting it could actually rise as high as 3% this year as the Federal Reserve battles the hottest inflation since the 1980s. I love this chart, and the dollar is also gaining against a basket of peers. This is, without a doubt, the chart that I like the most, and thank you so much for all the people writing in saying how interesting they thought it was. It goes to the fact that the credit market could now be showing signs of stress, raising the chances of a disorderly rise in yields, piling further pressure on global risk assets. So we see a key measure of U.S. corporate credit risk reaching some of the highest since we saw from September 2020. Its European equivalent also soared after some strong U.S. payrolls data and a hawkish ECB stoked expectations for pretty aggressive rate hikes around the globe. Thank you uh, for actually charting these two profiles on the same graphic. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lyons in New York are Anne Edwards here in London. This is Bloomberg. Central banks have been playing catch-up to the reality of what's happened with inflation. The Fed needs to move quickly to 
clearly behind the curve. I think that we've largely priced in a more aggressive Fed. The market is now going through a major reassessment of duration risk across assets. Bonds are down, but not out. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, February 8. Our top stories today. More misery in the world's biggest bond markets. With the sell-off in focus, how quickly does the 10-year Treasury yield get to 2%? President Biden warns Russia the controversial Nord Stream 2 pipeline would be stopped if there's an invasion of Ukraine. Russia has denied it plans to attack. And SoftBank goes to plan B. It will now take arm public after NVIDIA abandons a proposed acquisition of the chip designer. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, everybody. This is the early edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines over in New York. And Kayleigh, it seems that, yes, the rising yield environment, reassessment of assets underway as a result, but European equities at least, fairly resilient resilient in the face of that. Yeah, and you saw some resilience in Asia as well, Anna, at least when it came to Japan, but other benchmarks were lower, including in Hong Kong and China. And we actually just had the headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal that now state funds in China are stepping in to slow the slowdown in the stock market. However, that didn't take place today because you did see the CSI 300 falling by about half of 1%, taking the broad MSCI Asia Pacific index down just slightly with it, down less than a tenth of 1%. There's really two individual company stories to note, though, from Asia overnight. One being SoftBank, which Anna mentioned, it did actually see its vision fund returning to profitability in the last quarter of the year after having a record loss in the quarter before that. So that's a good thing. But they do have to move to plan B with ARM, that chip designer after NVIDIA abandoned that deal. They're not going to take it public. Like SoftBank shares were down about nine tenths of a percent in Japan overnight. The other story I wanted to point to is Wuxi Biologics. This is a Chinese biotech company was placed on the U.S. unverified list. That took the stock down about 23 percent in Hong Kong before shares were halted for trading. And of course, that does raise some concerns about U.S.-China tensions more broadly. But finally, it isn't just about stock selling off. It is also what is happening in the bond market. Sovereign debt really under pressure across the world. That was true, too, in Australia. That 10-year yield moving up. 12 and a half basis points to 2.12 percent. That is the highest going all the way back to March of 2019, Matt. Yeah, I'm watching uh, the 10 year yield here, Kaylee, and uh, watching oil as well. Both of them are near levels that could be pretty exciting, although they're just big round numbers, right? S&P futures right now a little changed. We actually closed the day down on the S&P yesterday, but unchanged on the Dow. The 10 year yield 19359. So we're watching two. We're on 2.00 watch. Um, I don't know what difference it makes. That's something we're going to be asking our guests, but it's definitely getting closer and closer. NYMEX crude, I was on $100 watch, but we've come down. Remember Friday, um, we were up over $93 a barrel. So it is, on the one hand, um, it's pretty uh, aggressive looking at WTI with a 90 handle. On the other hand, we've been here for a few sessions and we're not hitting the highs that we hit last week. Bitcoin coming down a little bit from the price at midnight tonight, but still at $43,932. So getting to that $44,000 level, it's not been a bad couple of weeks for the digital currency. Anna? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. I like how we like the round numbers. We also think it's a little simplistic to focus on them, don't we? We're sort of torn on that one. Uh, let's have a look at the map then across European equity markets. I was saying to Kaylee how we see resilience across the European equity space in the face of those higher yields. Certainly that's the narrative coming through from Treasuries in this morning's European session. That's where the yield story is focused. Europe looks a little more divided and perhaps that gives some room for European equities to make gains today. And in fact, nearly all sectors in positive territory in today's session. One of the sectors doing really well is basic research Sources. This plays to the strengths of London, of course, and we see that that sector is up by just over 3%. Nearly all of the names in that sector moving to the upside. I put in euro dollar. This is really a dollar move, a dollar move attached to treasuries, but there is something in it about the euro as well. The euro is considerably weaker then, down three tenths of a percent. It's been doing pretty well through February, though. That's the backstory. 114 is where we trade. BP, the energy major, up by one and a half percent. Cash return to shareholders. Once again, a theme throwing off cash as they transition that business. We talked to the CEO a little bit earlier, Ron Bernard Looney. We'll bring you more of that conversation a little later. And Ocado, grocery delivery and technology business, down by 11.4%, Kaylee. A real focus on the extent to which this business has to invest to try and take advantage of the growth opportunities. All right, Anna, a few stocks to watch in the European session. There is one stock to watch here in the U.S. as well on some breaking news. Uh, Peloton CEO John Foley is said to step down 
and become executive chairman. This is according to Dow Jones, also reporting that it will cut roughly $800 million in annual costs, including cutting 2,800 jobs, affecting 20% of corporate positions. They also, Peloton, planning to drop plans for a new factory in Ohio. We briefly saw those shares moving into positive territory in pre-market, now down 1.8%, actually 2.4%. And remember, remember, Peloton will be reporting after the bell today, so we'll continue to monitor that stock. Now we'll look at what else is ahead today other than Peloton's earnings. Europe Chip Act is to be published. The EU wants to rival the U.S., but there are increasing doubts about member states and European lawmakers over how to make existing funds available. Also, in terms of earnings, we will get results from Pfizer at 6.45 a.m. New York time. As mentioned, Peloton will be reporting after the bell as well as Lyft. And finally, we'll get U.S. trade balance data at 8.30 a.m. New York time, Matt. All right, we're watching for all of that. Also, I mean, really the focus, right? Sovereign bonds extending declines, 10-year yields approaching 2% here. Investors grappling with the implications of a global monetary policy tightening. Let's get some more with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny? Matt, it really has been remarkable to watch the front end of the curve doubling when it comes to G10 short-term yields. Now, a lot of this is the U.S., it's Europe, this reaction to an about face from the ECB, more hawkishness from the Fed. But this time around, there are signs that this sell-off in treasuries and global debt could be more disorderly than it has been in the past. And really, the indicator here is credit spread. So I have a chart in front of me for our radio listening audience. What I'm looking at is last time we saw 10-year yields rise last year, IG credit spreads, they played along. They were still very thin. But this time, just in the start of this week, we've started to see uh, spreads widen. This often acts as the canary in the coal mine that risk assets are being in impacted by higher yields and it's often sometimes used as the indication as the push for that Powell put now it's not just this chart it's not just the US it is Europe as well let me take you to credit in the euro in the eurozone as well both high yield and IG also seeing spreads widen it's a little bit of an awkward situation for Christine Lagarde who in the press conference last week said that they hadn't seen any material impact to spreads in Europe well this is starting to happen the question though is whether this is just a repricing with less liquidity from the ECB or Anna if this is the first signs of a wider debt crisis. Absolutely something to keep in focus then. Danny thank you very much Bloomberg. Danny Berger on the markets. Let's get back to geopolitics. The French President Emmanuel Macron will travel to Ukraine today to meet with President Vladimir Zelensky a day after Macron sat down with the Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Meanwhile President Biden taking a firm stance on Russia after meeting with the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the White House yesterday. If Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. Now, Moscow has repeatedly, of course, denied any plans to invade Ukraine, which we could keep, uh, should keep pointing out. Our European correspondent Maria Tadeo joins us now from Brussels, and our Washington correspondent Joe Matthew is with us from D.C., both to lend uh, their analysis. Maria, let's start with you, and we're just actually getting some lines coming through from the Kremlin. On the one hand, conciliatory, saying that the Russian troops uh, will return to base after their Belarus exercise, so conciliatory at least on the troops present in that country, uh, but then also saying Russia and France reached no deals on security issues. The West is not ready to take Russian concerns into account. What, what's the latest? Well, Anna, two things. One, of course, is that you could argue it's a positive sign that these troops are being pulled back. The concern, particularly for NATO, was that we could see that troop up uh, buildup in Belarus increase. So this points to the opposite. But it's interesting that the Russian government is clarifying uh, that meeting with Emmanuel Macron yesterday. We know that this was almost a six-hour uh, meeting that they had. And interestingly enough, yesterday the French seemed to be briefing that they had some sort of promise from the Russians that there would be no more military initiatives along Ukraine while the talks are ongoing. Now, what the Russians are saying, perhaps clarifying this uh, comment, is that yesterday in this meeting between Emmanuel Macron and Vladimir Putin with no one else but their translators, is that there was nothing on paper, that nothing was agreed. Now, funnily enough, we are also hearing from Emmanuel Macron, who's just uh, landed in Ukraine, saying, when you ask me what did I achieve in this meeting, well, I would say there's been no escalation and there's been no degradation for the situation. So for the time being, that is good enough.
more importantly, Olaf Scholz from Germany was here meeting with uh, Joe Biden from the USA. And Biden seemed to make promises for Scholz that he will find very difficult to keep when he turns, returns to Berlin. Look, uh, two things. Uh, when you speak to the Germans, the goal behind this meeting, they argue, was about damage control. They were concerned about the criticism that Germany has been soft on Russia. This has been an idea building for weeks now. So Olaf Scholz wanted to send for a years. very clear message to the U.S. for years, in fact. But he wanted to send a clear message that NATO and Germany and the United States are fully aligned. He gave an interview yesterday on primetime TV. A lot of this was damage control. They wanted to really contain the criticism. The second point that you allude to, Matt, is about the Nord Stream 2. President Biden said there would be no Nord Stream 2 if Ukraine invades. But you know very well that this is not a yes or no answer question for mm -hmm. Germany. If they ditch this, and the thing is already built, I mean, this is done already, they could face litigation, taxpayer money could go into this, and this could be a very tricky legal situation to for Germany. So I would argue to all of Schultz's credit, this is not just a yes or no question to the Germans. We're simplifying a question that's actually very complex. All right. Thanks to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels with the view from Europe. Now let's get the view from Washington and head over to Bloomberg's Joe Matthew in D.C. Joe, what's the Biden administration's feeling on how yesterday went and whether Biden and Schultz are on the same page? Well, the president was definitive. President Biden, Chancellor Schultz met for the better part of two hours, not quite the marathon session that we saw between Macron and Putin in their joint news conference that followed. Sanctions were the primary uh, topic here in Nord Stream to everyone's earlier point here, really dominated the conversation. The president was definitive, as you heard coming into this. We will bring it to an end, referring to the pipeline if Russia were to invade, which again, it says it is not planning. Despite repeated questioning, though, Chancellor Schultz never actually said the name Nord Stream 2 out loud. Reporters were quick to point this out. He did agree with President Biden at just about every turn, however, and he did break into English at one point for emphasis, saying, quote, we are acting together, we are absolutely united, and we will not take different steps. Earlier, Germany's foreign minister said the country was willing to pay a high economic price if Russia, in fact, chose to cut off gas to Europe. And we should note, incidentally, today, President Biden, who will certainly get more questions on this, has an event scheduled for this afternoon in which he will be speaking to the American people about efforts his administration is taking to, yes, lower the price of energy for and, everyday Americans. And does, I mean, he has to take a victory lap on his foreign policy right now because the House is looking at a stopgap bill um, yeah. to, to uh, continue a continuing resolution for the budget. And this was supposed to be the year that, you know, Build Back Better really bolstered um, the Democrats' platform, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Well, it's supposed to be the year regular order returned to the United States uh, Senate as well, which we're kind of waiting to see here. This in itself would be a big deal, Matt, having uh, lived through continuing resolutions, kicking the can for months upon months. Since October, in fact, the country has been operating under a continuing resolution, and they're going to pass another one today. To your point, the Senate will follow the House. But it does appear, this will go through March 11th, Matt, that they're, they're on the verge of a breakthrough. We'll have a $1.5 trillion budget if all 12 appropriation bills get done in time here. That would unlock not just the top line number, but the billions of dollars in the infrastructure law that need to go out to communities to start work. So that would be in itself considered a win, while, while normal business mm. for most in Washington, a win for this White House. Joe, thank you very much, Bloomberg's Joe Matthew. You can listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. Now, on to tech news, and NVIDIA is abandoning its purchase of ARM from SoftBank, bowing to regulatory opposition. SoftBank now plans to proceed with an IPO of ARM in lieu of the deal. It's like back to the future feel about this one. Uh, let's get more from Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie, who joins us on set here in London. Tom, I remember when ARM was listed in London, and then it wasn't anymore, and it was part of SoftBank. But here we are. Uh, what's the latest update? So this may happen in 2023. It's likely to happen in the US. The IPO of ARM, the Cambridge UK based designer of chips, of course, a sector that has only developed and gained more prominence in the last two years, the crucial factors around this space. And what the concerns were around this, and you remember this, the regulatory concerns, of course, most pronounced in the US, but you also had the sense that the Europeans, the UK, even the Chinese were unlikely to sign off on this deal for arm to be sold off to NVIDIA, the regulatory concerns because of the lack of neutrality. That was the concern, at least, because SoftBank did provide that neutrality. They didn't compete with any of ARM's customers. And, of course, ARM supplies to everyone from 
so smartphone makers mm. to, to, to auto makers. Then you had the concerns from the customers, okay, that ties into that regulatory scrutiny. So the deal is off. SoftBank are going to get 1.25 billion as the breakup fee, but SoftBank have a whole load of other concerns. They've got exposure to Chinese technology. That's been a drag, particularly Alibaba, one of its biggest assets, which is down about 50% over the last year. And of course, they have that broader sell-off that they've had to factor in around the tech space. So they're having to adjust. Masayoshi Son coming out on the back of these earnings saying that the storm is getting stronger, particularly in the United States. But for ARM, yes, we're looking at an IPO, likely in the US. The question is, can they raise as much? They were going to sell uh, for about 40 billion US dollars. Mm. We'll look uh, to see whether they can attract that kind of valuation. All right, Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie with a look at one company we're watching. Thank you so much. Let's take a look at some others that are moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. as well. One being GM. Adam Jonas over at Morgan Stanley downgrading this stock because of a weaker 2022 outlook. He also has some questions about the viability of EV industrialization. That stock is down about 3.6% before the bell. Another stock moving lower is Take Two. The video game maker gave a weak revenue forecast after the bell yesterday. Investors really waiting for answers as to the timing of the next installment of the Grand Theft Auto franchise. I feel like that might be a video game that Matt Miller is pretty into. That stock is down about 2.4%. And finally, also to the downside, Peloton. Shares were already lower. They have gone even lower on the back of that Dow Jones report that the chairman, uh, that CEO John, John, John Foley will be stepping down and becoming executive chairman. They're also going to do some cost cutting, cutting 2,800 jobs, according to that report. It will be reporting after the bell today, so I'm sure we're going to get more information on this as well as any potential conversation around a potential takeover Anna, but right now that stock is mm. down about 4.4% before the bell. Our Bloomberg Opinion co uh, colleague Andrea Felstead writing a piece to Peloton saying, come on, just do it. Just get caught <laughs> Nike. We'll see if that kind of tie uh, becomes attractive to anybody involved. Coming up on this program, Beata Manthi, City Head of European Equity Strategy. She'll join us. Why this resilience for European equity markets in the face of the rising yields and the deepening bond route. How the market is responding to the prospect of supersized rate hikes. If that is what we get, how will inflation data this week play into those uh, assumptions? Plus, BP boosting buybacks after hitting its highest profit in more than a decade. Part of our interview with the company's CEO shortly. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lines, Anna Edwards with us in London. Now, we have been watching to see when the blood in spreads. We saw it first in sovereign spreads. Now we're seeing it in credit spreads around the globe would hit risk assets. We're certainly not seeing that in Europe today as the uh, indexes rise 1% and change. Let's talk to Lynn Thomason about that, Bloomberg Managing Editor for EMEA Markets. Um, Lynn, you know, uh, Mark Gilbert in his piece today was saying at some point this is going to affect companies that can't borrow for as cheaply as they once could, and yet we're not seeing that reflected in stock prices. Why not? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I would almost, it, it's almost, we haven't quite gotten there yet for it to filter through through the companies. I think, you know, compared with supply chain chaos, COVID, inflation, um, you know, perhaps the borrowing cost story will, will come a little bit later down the line. I mean, I think now everyone's talking about, um, you know, how are tech companies and, um, you know, the wider economy overall going to deal with the supply chain story? Uh, good morning to you, Lynn. Does this cause real pain for companies? Do they, uh, do they just not refinance as rates go higher? Is that, is that what happens here? They just stick with the deals they've got? And if, I suppose the ones that will be in pain are the ones where, the, where their deals end and they roll over and the, there's higher rates to roll onto. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a big story. Of, like, if you wanted to refinance, the time to do that was a few months ago. And now um, you're perhaps seeing a bit of a slowdown. I mean, I think the other thing to keep in mind is reality is, you know, rates are still relatively low compared to history. So, yes, they are increasing. But but, I mean, if you look on a historical level, you know, borrowing costs are fairly cheap compared to, you know, say, mm. you know, a few years ago. And if you have the pricing power, that might still look, <laughs> that might still look OK for a corporate. Lynn, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Lynn Thomason with the latest on the markets. Remember, you can get market analysis. Check out MLIV Go on your terminal. That is the function to use to get across the Market Live Teams blog. This is Bloomberg.
time now for the first word news and in Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is blasting the protest by truckers that has now halted commercial traffic to the U.S. at the busiest border crossing. The protesters say they won't stop until all COVID restrictions are lifted. Trudeau says they are hobbling the economy and trying to undermine democracy. Meanwhile, Hong Kong is ramping up restrictions as it fights an unprecedented COVID outbreak. The city is extending limits to private premises for the first time. Multi-household gatherings will be limited to two families. And Hong Kong is also expanding the list of venues included in its vaccine mandate. And billionaire Peter Thiel is leaving the board of Facebook's parent Meta to pursue Donald Trump's agenda. Bloomberg has learned that Thiel will focus on backing Republican candidates for Senate who advance the former president's policies. Thiel has advised Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg for almost two decades. Coming up, we'll get back to the markets. Take a look at this bond market route globally and what it means for equities with Beata Manti, head of European equity strategy at Citigroup. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. Here is what you need to know. That sell-off in the world's largest bond markets is widening. That could push the benchmark U.S. 10-year Treasury yield past 2%. Yields have surged about 80 basis points since August. Traders have been betting on Fed rate hikes this year. A warning from President Biden. He says the controversial Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Russia and Germany would be stopped if Vladimir Putin orders an invasion of Ukraine. The president's comments came after a meeting with Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Russia has repeatedly denied it plans an invasion. And in corporate news, SoftBank now plans an IPO for ARM. NVIDIA dropped a proposed $40 billion takeover of the chip designer after regulators and customers objected. SoftBank will get a breakup fee of more than $1.2 billion. So that's the focus in terms of corporates, in terms of the macro environment. Matt, what are you focused this morning uh, on as we head towards the start of U.S. trade? Well, I have to say, I think SoftBank is actually going to bag about $2 billion in total. So... It seems like that's pretty good money for the work, right? So SoftBank now moving to plan B, very interesting. In terms of U.S. markets here, uh, we're watching S&P futures doing a whole lot of nothing. So what we're really focused on is the U.S. 10-year yield. You mentioned that round number of 2% is interesting if for no other reason than that it is a round number. But it's also been a massive climb, right? Just Thursday, we were looking at a 7 handle here, and now we're on a 9. So watching the 10-year yield continue to climb, NYMEX crude slipping now back down below $90 a barrel. It was 93 and change at one point during Friday's session so it's still strong um, prices are still relatively high but we're not getting up to that hundred dollar uh, number that a lot of people on the street have forecast in fact uh, yesterday um, I heard Phil Orlando from Federated Hermes say he thinks 110, 120 by year end for crude. And then Bitcoin is off from the price at midnight tonight, but it's still higher than it was yesterday when we talked about it. $43,815 headed for 44. So keep an eye on uh, Bitcoin continuing to move higher. Kaylee, what are you looking at in terms of pre-market movers? Well, there's a couple stocks that are moving higher, Matt. Both of them actually report before the bell today. Cody Beauty and Pfizer, both getting bid up ahead of those results. Cody Beauty actually is higher by the better part of 5%, while Pfizer is up about 1.7%. Of course, with Pfizer, a lot of focus will be on the sales guidance for its COVID-19 vaccine. To the downside, though, General Motors down a little more than uh, three, uh, three quarters percent after Adam Jonas over at Morgan Stanley downgraded the stock on the weaker 2022 outlook. Also, some questions questions about execution risk as far as EVs go. So that stock is moving lower, as is Peloton, which we'll be reporting after the bell today. Remember, this stock up more than 20% yesterday on reports of takeover interest from another number of different companies. Now we have reports this morning that the CEO, John Foley, will be stepping down to become executive chairman, as well as some cost-cutting efforts underway. I'm sure we'll hear more about that throughout the day, and especially after those earnings, Anna. But ahead of all of that, Peloton is down about 3% before the bell. 
OK, and in terms of the European picture then, Kaylee, we said half an hour ago that things are looking pretty resilient, and they are. We still have moves to the upside on the stock 600, up by four-tenths of 1%. But we don't necessarily have quite the breadth we did. Nearly all sectors were in positive territory half an hour ago. Now, it's around two-thirds of those sectors. One sector doing really well is basic resources. Nearly all of the stocks in that sector moving to the upside as we digest higher commodity prices. Support from China for steelmakers. Uh, better for them, better for their profits. Maybe not so good for the environment, but certainly uh, something that is boosting mining uh, mining stocks today the euro is in focus or is it the dollar the dollar is definitely in focus as we see higher yields over in the United States that is pushing demand into the greenback the euro paying a little bit of a price there down a quarter of one percent at uh, 114 is the handle BP that's certainly a stock we're watching because of the uh, the, the scale of the uh, of the reporting that we got out of this uh, energy giant they are of course an energy giant in transition from oil to other things we heard a lot about their capital expenditure plans also about buybacks and that was something that certainly uh, lifted the share price at the start of the trading day and Ocado grocery retailer and tech business sells its technology around the world of course or operates its technology around the world to grocery businesses not just in the UK uh, but the focus really for investors and the reason we've seen the weakness in the share price is is it really all worth it all that investment to try and keep pace with the opportunities in that sector a focus on the amount of capital expenditure they have to uh, they have to endure Matt right especially in a rising rate environment joining us now to talk about that is Beata Manti head of of European equity strategy at City. Beata, um, in terms of spreads, you know, we've all been watching them blow out, especially on the periphery, but even um, core rates are rising at a rapid pace. I believe the buns have risen for 10 sessions in a row. If they falter today, um, that'll end the streak. But uh, those yields haven't risen for 10 sessions in a row since the year 2000. At what point does this affect company costs and, and hit um, the equity prices? Because for now, um, European equities are still doing really well. Hi, much. Thanks, guys, for having me. So everything in equity markets recently have been a bond trade, right? It's, it's just different parts of bond markets have been driving uh, driving different parts of equity markets. When it comes to the recent rise in uh, in the European uh, periphery spreads, we think this is really the reaction, the natural and expected reaction uh, to the more hawkish uh, ECB. So that's what the market is trying to reprise right now. So it is plausible we are now going to get a um, rate hike from ECB by the end of the year in the in the fourth quarter, and uh, and really spreads have been periphery spreads have been always more vulnerable right so we think there is no panic yet you know they the spreads have come up however they are not in, at alarming levels and we don't think mm. at that point they are a risk to the equity markets however if they were to rise uh, much more and faster then of course you would start looking into risk of environment and the most vulnerable parts of equity markets to excessively high spreads would be would be banks. OK, so that's the bank link. We have explored that a lot over the last 10 years and we'll continue to do so as it becomes relevant, Beata. One thing you point out in your notes to us is that you want to buy the dip in some technology names. Does that extend to, is that European technology names? Because I see that we have a dip in European technology today, even as the rest of the European equity space is rising. Tech is a weak spot. Absolutely. So we've been always worried that growth stocks would be would be vulnerable to the rise of interest rates and especially the, the, the one bit of the bond market to uh, to observe is the to focus on if you're interested in tech stocks is the direction of the real yields so our view is and the view of our rate strategies is that the the move higher on the real rates real yields have been so steep that perhaps we'll have some consolidation in the near term and when i look at the reaction of the european tech we really see this being in oversold territory. So the level of the current real yields would suggest mm. European tech should be trading at around 26 times PE. It's trading at 23 times PE. Last time it was trading at these levels, uh, US real yields were at zero, not at mm. negative 50 basis points. So a lot of this further move is already in the price. All right, so you've seen tech reacting to yields. Yields have been reacting to central banks. And we think when we think about the ECB's hawkish pivot in particular, Goldman Sachs actually just published this morning saying that especially in Europe, 
Europe, there's signs that the problems that plagued Europe in the last cycle, low nominal GDP growth, disinflation, no earnings, are finally diminishing. And that is actually what this hawkish pivot signals. Do you agree with that? So if that's the case, of course, this is the posi positive for the market, right? But at one point, the market is going to start worrying that perhaps ECB is doing things too fast because of the inflation being uh, stubbornly high and eventually it will hurt growth. You know, the reaction of the spreads coming back to what we've discussed at the beginning doesn't signal that yet. Beata, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Beata Manthi, Head of European Equity Strategy at Citibank. Thanks for joining us. And don't miss Bloomberg's monthly series, Chief Future Officer. The latest episode features the Mondelez CFO, Luca Zaramella. Uh, you can also check out our interview with the Macy's CFO, Adrian Mitchell, on Bloomberg.com and on YouTube. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Carrier Chairman and CEO Dave Gitlin. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Let's get more on that breaking news on Peloton, the Wall Street Journal reports the CEO, John Foley, will step down. He does become executive chair, though, so he's not leaving the company. The stock falling in pre-market trading. Andrea Felstead, Bloomberg opinion columnist, joins us now for more from London. So this is a company that has been pummeled, but looks now, Andrea, like um, it's in play uh, as a, a possible um, sale. That's right. Um, we've had reports over the last few days that Amazon and Nike were looking at the company. Uh, so, yes, clearly. So it's either looking for an independent future by doing this or it's trying to show that it has an independent plan to get a higher price. OK, Andrea, good morning. So uh, of the of the potential bidders, and we'll see who, who actually comes <laughs> out of the woodwork here, but Amazon, you mentioned, Nike also being discussed. What, may, what would make most sense as a sort of union? I think Nike would be the better uh, combination because Nike's whole ethos is fitness. And when you look at some of the Nike price points, the high, at the higher level, they're clearly up a premium approaching luxury, and that's the same positioning as Peloton. Well, obviously, we'll get a better picture of Peloton's exact position when they report after the bell and get a picture of what demand is looking like. Why would Peloton be an attractive asset given some of the trials and tribulations it has had with waning demand for its products as we emerge from the stay-at-home world? It can give an acquirer lots of data about its well-heeled users, and they can use that to sell other products to them. So who are the other uh, likely suitors? I mean, is it possible that we see an Apple come in? Why am I hearing about Disney? <laughs> um, Apple definitely makes sense. Uh, for Disney, I guess it's the streaming wars. It's, it's getting uh, people in front of those screens for longer time. And again, it's the data. It's all about the data. Thank you so much to Andrea Felstead of Bloomberg Opinion for that news on Peloton and getting her insight. Now, we want to focus back on the bond market. We are starting to see a little bit of a reversal in European yields today, specifically on the periphery where yields are now starting to come in. But really, it doesn't go that far to reverse the dramatic moves we have seen since last Thursday when Christine Lagarde gave that more hawkish press conference. What we've seen is spreads blowing out really across the periphery. And I have a chart here for our listeners on London DAB Digital Radio. Basically, all you need to know is it shows green. Greece, Italy, and Spain's 10-year yield, the spread over the 10-year German Bund yield. Those have widened out substantially. For Greece, now 225 basis points above the Bund. For the BTPs, now 156 basis points. Let's get more now with Marcus Ashworth, Bloomberg opinion columnist who covers the European markets for us. Marcus, as I said, we're starting to see a little bit of a reversal of the moves today. Is this a move that has been overdone and is now correcting? <laughs> Yes, I think it's the simplest way of putting it. I mean, it's not much of a correction, particularly for Italy, but I mean, the Greece thing was just a classic, illiquid, very small market, one or maybe two large sellers. Yeah, I don't know, we have Japanese year end coming up. Uh, it's possible that someone's just decided ahead of French elections and 
a, a wide variety of, of, of changes, uh, clearly, of what's on the ECB's thinking. I mean, it's evident that Lagarde has not wrote back on her comments uh, of, of Thursday, which I think she was forced into making by a significant minority on the governing council saying they wanted policy changed last Thursday, which is really quite shocking. That, you know, but she's controlled it. She, she made clear to say that she backed the peripheral and there will be ongoing support and it will be gradual. And that's really what people needed to hear to calm things down. However, this is a fundamental repricing of European risk. So things do look a little calmer this morning, but a fundamental repricing underway, you say, Marcus. Uh, tell us about the Greek specifics here, because a lot of people talking about how you know Greece is different depending on which of the asset purchase schemes the ECB currently has in play. And if we're going to transition from one to another at some point, it will become critical to know when that is, to know how much support Greece is going to get and Greek debt is going to get from the central bank. OK, I think it's a bit of a storm and teacup. First things first, I mean, Lagarde made clear, and needs to be made clear on Thursday, that though they still haven't got around to altering the existing and the, what's about to replace the pandemic programme, that's the APP. That's what's going to become, for probably only a very brief while, the main and probably only buyer of European bonds. That cannot buy Greek debt. They haven't bothered to change it. Probably no point. The reason we is they're going to stop it fairly soon anyway, certainly before the end of this year. The, pre, the existing PEP program, which is miles bigger and a lot more flexible, has so much reinvestment power, 440 billion euros probably this year alone. It can do what it wants. That's got more than enough cover for Greece. Greece itself has done so much in the last few years to overborrow when it had the window. It's taken it, having been shut out of the bond markets for so long in Europe. It's got plenty of, of, of funding in, in, in the locker. It doesn't need to worry. It's just a small, minuscule market, very liquid, with one large seller yesterday. And, well, uh, underestimating um, Greece as well as Spain and Italy was a problem in the past for the ECB. I noted in uh, Mark Gilbert's column, Rupert Harrison tweet, that I thought was just really interesting. Um, Rupert uh, says that it really feels like central bankers around the world are making a collective policy mistake trying to use rapid rate rises to cool inflation that's driven mainly by supply constraints, just as growth momentum is slowing. Is this a problem, Marcus? No. Um, uh, <laughs> Rupert Harris is a very interesting guy. Uh, I disagree with him on supply constraints. I think they're going. I think growth momentum is there. We can see that for non-farm payroll numbers alone in the States. I'm not so worried about growth. However, he's very right to point out the possibility of this, and this is clearly... The ECB being browbeaten and dragged against their will to start having to do something about inflation. Look, I think uh, Jim O'Neill put it best yesterday. You know, the, why have we still got QE? Why were they still doing QE all of last year? It's madness. We need to think about forgetting about inflation targeting and sorting out how central banks are run because they've been asleep at the wheel and allow this inflation boost to carry on and get out of control. And now they may possibly be panicking. The only thing that gives me confidence actually is Jerome Powell. People seem to misunderstand his wording. He said they're going to be nimble, the Fed. That means they don't always just have to hike five, six, seven times, as some people think. They will probably almost certainly stop if they overdo it or think they're going to overdo it. And that's what we have to okay. hope for. But the central banks okay. have learned that lesson, and equally the ECB have learned. OK, Marcus, thank you very much. Yeah, cheap money. Not always been a fan of, uh, of the quantitative easing programmes. The world gets back to the right side of zero, writes Marcus Ashworth this, uh, uh, this week on the Bloomberg Terminal. A Bloomberg opinion columnist covering European markets. We thank Marcus for his time. Coming up, we'll get back to the corporate agenda. BP boosting buybacks after hitting its highest profit in more than a decade. Part of our interview with the company's CEO next. This is Bloomberg. Of uncertainty um, but what I will say is that demand is strong um, and you can um, easily see a, a further tightening market uh, throughout this year but more than anything I think we should expect some volatility and at the end of the day we don't know what the price of oil is going to be 
That was the BP CEO Bernard Looney speaking with Bloomberg TV earlier on today. Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, uh, joins us now. Interesting that there's a company, Tom, that's benefited, of course, from higher gas prices, higher oil prices. Yeah. Is there a little bit of geopolitics in there? We see oil prices coming off this morning. What's on your mind? It's a Matt Miller m message. I mean, he's driving the H2 around northern New York City here, uh, and it's, you know, I mean, it's up 5% since the beginning of the year. Oil's up 5%, triple-A unleaded gas uh, as well. Anna, let's look at inflation. This is not only oil, it's rent and the rest of it as well. We're getting ready for that huge inflation report that we see here in a few days. In white, services elevated always, 3% service inflation for a number of years. Goods, outright deflation, disinflation, quiescent, as Chairman Greenspan would say. And then we had a pandem pandemic. We moved from 1.5% goods inflation to 3.7% goods inflation. Service sector goes right up to the same point as well. So we've got a blended 3.7% is part of that ugly single statistic of 7%. I will be, without telling you what cars I'm driving, Tom, this month, there will be a twin turbocharged 4-liter V8. A naturally aspirated 6.2 liter V8 and a supercharged 6.2 yeah. liter Hemi. Um, yeah. With that said, isn't it good that gas prices are up to the highest they've been since 2014? Don't we want to reduce <clears throat> carbon emissions? Uh, that's, uh, I would say that's a tertiary factor. It's definitely there, Matt. You're absolutely correct. But it's overwhelmed by other factors. And the major one right here is political. It'll be interesting to see off of the inflation report on Thursday, how the White House and others react. What's important here is one month of 7%, two months of 7%. What if a third or fourth month is elevated like that? That changes the dialogue. All right, well, we'll wait and see how that data unfolds on Thursday. Thank you so much to Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. He didn't get to tell us what he's driving right now. We'll have to get him back to talk about that next time. I am watching geopolitics right now, though. We just got some headlines out of Emmanuel Macron. who was speaking to reporters after his talks with Vladimir Putin in Moscow yesterday. He says he got assurances from Putin of no more escalation. And we actually are seeing oil markets reacting to that headline in that crude is moving lower, down about two percentage points on uh, Brent WTI down by about 1.8%. So maybe some of that geopolitical risk premium starting to come out of the oil market. But it's interesting, we aren't getting consistent messaging between Macron and Russia because the Kremlin said earlier that Russia and France, France reached no deals on security issues. So I think we're going to have to wait for some more clarity, Matt. Absolutely be watching that, the oil market watching it closely for sure. We're also watching Peloton, not only because earnings are coming out after the bell or because the CEO is stepping down to become the executive chairman, but mainly because they're in play. Um, they could be taking over. Andrea Felstead just joining us says um, Nike could be a possible suitor, but we've heard a range of other names from Amazon and Apple to Disney, which I think is interesting. I do want to point out, there is only one way to pronounce Nike <laughs> properly. That's the way uh, the people who founded the company say it. And while we're on the subject, there is only mm -hmm. one proper way to say Adidas. Mm. Because I, yes, the I, name... I feel this message is landing at my feet. I, I, <laughs> no. I'm with you. I mean, it's, it's, it's not difficult, Matt. We lean American with Nike. We lead German with Adidas. I, I, I think I'm on board with your messaging there. I probably got my German pronunciation wrong. I, I'm looking at a corporate as well. I'm looking at Arm, the future of Arm. I remember when it was listed in London, when it was such a tech darling. I remember the disappointment, the politics that was, that was playing out as we saw it being swallowed up by uh, Japan's SoftBank. It's coming back to the market, but looks as if London may miss out. Likely to go to the Nasdaq is what uh, is what we're being told and um, arm ceo rene Haas, actually quite new into the role talking about the opportunities for the chip designer in autos some cars having 30 to 40 chips he pointed out cloud computing of, uh, obviously another opportunity that this uh, this chip designer is working on extensively more bloomberg surveillance is ahead we'll hear from jim karen of morgan stanley and francis donald of manulife amongst other voices this is bloomberg <laughs>